everybody back here to the Martin Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY Midtown Manhattan in New York City. Uh, again, a little bit of sun out here today and um, the vaccine has been approved yesterday. The first vaccination will take place, I think, next week. And um, so things um, in a way are moving ahead around us at the Graduate Center. Our shops are down at almost 20 percent of shops are closed. And, and again, and as we always say, everything that belongs to the field and the landscape of theater of performance um, is uh, devastated. Uh, there are no performances, no jobs, uh, and no nothing where we really can see go back to what we um, normally practice um, our field. And, um, and it does not look very good that it will even pick up next fall. So it's a moment in the history um, of New York City um, and especially then also for the performing arts. And this is our field that is historic. Um, it is catastrophic uh, and in a way apocalyptic. And calyptic is that Greek word of revealing. Apo, so it's, something is taken off, you look at the inside. And it was not always a negative uh, uh, doomsday connotation. It was also often a connotation of the um, representation of the divine on the, that Monday. This is, I think, uh, the, the, what theater and art is also close to, um, as John Cage always reminded us in his work. And But the question is, what is really revealed in this apocalypse uh, we are going through now? And um, and it's an important moment to remember, and that uh, even as intense uh, we are experiencing this moment, there's a long history of mankind, a long history of the U.S., a long history of New York City, and there have been moments um, where uh, the city uh, uh, life uh, has been deeply infected, it was in danger, it uh, changed radically, whether it was uh, World War I, World War II, uh, the Raft Triads, um, the time of the revolution, that famous Hamilton's period where we heard so much about it now, but also the 70s in New York City. And it was a time of uh, uh, um, great uh, uh, upheaval of dangerous moments for the city. Wall Street, I think, threatened to leave. And it's only because some brave citizens and people got together and uh, paid uh, taxes I had for 10 years and kind of uh, kept the city afloat. It didn't went bankrupt. And, um, but it was also a time that uh, marked uh, the arts, especially the performing arts also um, in, in, the, in the US, but also worldwide and globally. It produced a, a, a generation of artists that was remarkable. So with us here is Hilary Miller. Hilary, thank you. Thank you for um, uh, uh, joining us. Hilary is a professor of theater and she wrote a book. She really researched intensely that period of the 70s. The book is called Drop Dead, Performance in Crisis, 1970s New York. It came out of the Rutledge and she is teaching 20th and 21st century drama in Queens College and also at the Graduate Center. And her area of specialization includes theater post-World War II in the United States, performance in the city and contemporary playwriting and also, I think, uh, writing for the screen, television. She did a great book. Um, this. Um, with interviews and she wrote for um, everybody was published uh, the who is who whether it is uh, PHA, TTR, um, the Journal of Applied Theater and Performance, Theater Journal, Performance Research. So it's a, um, an, an, an important contribution actually she she is uh, making to this. So Hillary, how are you? How is teaching going in, uh, in, uh, in New York City? Oh, it's going okay. It's going okay. I'm doing great. Uh, so thank you for, for having me here. I mean, great. Overall, fine, right? With everything happening. Um, teaching's going good. I mean, I think that's one of the ways that I'm experiencing this whole time is through um, the teaching um, online. And I think, uh, I mean, I teach at Queens College. So mm -hmm. the, the, the chances that someone in one of my classes has um, been affected it, extremely closely by um, the disease, uh, by the illness is actually pretty high. Um, and that's been a kind of overlay of the challenge uh, right now is just thinking about um, thinking about all of the aspects of teaching as I'm as 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 many people have been trying to suggest it's not just a process of saying how do we take the classes we're doing in person and just putting those online. It's actually that much more about how do you attend to different aspects of students that are under such immense stress. Um, 
So it's been just a journey along with um, uh, everyone else who finds themselves teaching online where you feel quite lucky to be able to be doing so. But then on the other hand, um, the challenges, whether it be um, students who are sharing a laptop with their you know, siblings and cousins and don't have privacy to be Zooming or whether it just be access to um, streaming materials. It's been a real wake up call. I think for me, being aware of how hard it is to find good performance teaching materials um, that can be streamed and made available for free to students has only been amplified um, now. Mm -hmm. So um, so it's been challenging. It's been um, challenging, but also um, uh, uh, an experience of, of figuring out what it is that can not only help students pedagogically, but maybe students who are, are incredibly isolated, um, as a lot of people are feeling, and they might be grieving. Um, and, and one of the things that I was actually just thinking about that I had been mentioning to you before the call was that, um, you know, the experience of teaching somewhere like, um, like in the CUNY system, when you pick up the New York Times and you pick up the newspaper, um, generally what is being discussed is how um, residential colleges are responding. You know, how many times a week uh, these schools are testing in order to be able to have students living on campus or, um, you know, how this is affecting the enrollments of um, residential schools when actually, um, I mean, the last number I was able to find was close, it was over 75% of students in the country were commuting, um, were commuter students. And that means that those students um, really need the resources that are at their institutions. And that means that when they're at home, they generally have other demands that are keeping them there as commuter students, but also making it harder for them to learn. So, you know, I've been trying to think through myself, like, how, um, I guess, as you mentioned, how something that I studied and researched. So the 1970s was a period that was devastating for the CUNY system. Um, and it really brought, it kind of ushered in a wave of austerity in the CUNY system specifically that um, we still live with, right, day, every day. So having studied that and, and having seen what it meant for public education and, and, and in some ways how it kind of um, altered the conversation so that um, essentially just not having the funds for public education became kind of the baseline even after the city recovered. Um, it's, it's pretty terrifying to be now in a system uh, where the cuts are not um, small or vague or general, they're actually uh, on the order of something that people are saying um, if it, if it happens in the worst case scenario, um, it, it would be a kind of loss to the system that we hadn't even seen before. So, so for me, all of that kind of comes, um, all that comes together in the classroom because you're also teaching students who, um, are very likely, um, still working, right? They're the ones who are delivering Amazon packages or they're living with, um, uh, healthcare workers, or they are uh, driving Ubers so that people can get to doctor's appointments. Um, so, I mean, the more that you start, um, you know, hearing the kind of, uh, I don't want to call it lip service, because I think it's so important that we have leaders who are calling out the people who are doing um, frontline work, but you do start to feel a little bit like, okay, well, what's behind that? Like if, if you're really acknowledging that these, that CUNY students or the students who are um, making the city run. I mean, I'm assuming you had a similar experience, Frank, where during the lockdown um, in March, I could look out my window. I was living in Woodside, Queens, and now in Brooklyn. But when I looked out my window, um, I saw who was making the city run, right? You saw the delivery people and you saw um, uh, largely immigrant workforce keeping the key food open. And so when you put on the TV and you hear your leaders acknowledging that as well, um, what is going to happen beyond just arguing over hazard pay or something, which is very important, but, but really thinking long term so that a system like the CUNY system or whatever institution it is that is, is public um, in its nature, what are we actually going to be thinking about doing in order to make sure that those people are not left behind in the recovery, which would yeah. probably be, I guess, 
like if you needed to put some of the takeaways from my book on kind of like a thumbnail, it would be about the sort of uneven recovery for a lot of theater uh, artists, companies, professions. So in some ways the teaching ends up kind of, you know, running smack into this conversation about um, austerity and budgeting uh, post uh, fiscal crisis in New York. Yeah, it is, it is quite something and it is true. What will the help really look like? We already exactly. learned that the small, the small business loans from the Trump administration, 99% did not go to small businesses. It went to gigantic corporations like, thank God it's Friday. So thank God it's mm -hmm. Friday. It got more money from the Trump mm -hmm. administration than CUNY colleges. You know, CUNY colleges that serve 250,000 yeah. students, uh, almost 80% of every first uh, African-American, Latino, Asian-American mm -hmm. A student first generation go to these colleges. It's such a significant, important contribution. Also, over 20 stages in New York City, bringing uh, arts and culture to the neighborhoods. And um, mm. it's, of course, one of the big questions. How will Is that, that what it is? Is it 20 stages in CUNY? Yes. Yes. Uh, I yeah, never I knew that. Wow. Today, and we are working on this to also get back together and also for our festival in 2022 to reactivate that. It's much of the largest. Uh, uh, conglomerate of theaters in the nation. Um, Hillary, um, it's uh, devastating, of course, you know, the situation yeah. with Queens, uh, I think the Queens Corona neighborhood, ironically yeah. enough, it's really called like this. It's 78% uh, of infections already, I think, in June or July. Mm -hmm. and, and now it's again the epicenter for so many reasons, of course, as you mentioned, and you're teaching mm -hmm. there, there's great service you do to the city. Uh, to the students, uh, to humanity, I think, uh, the access to art, access to education, and of, is, of what is of significance, and to participate in the political mm -hmm. process, and you educating the next generation, and it should be supported. It is the most valuable asset we, we have, so okay. we don't do what happened before. I know also you are, you are a practicing artist, and how, how did you experience Corona? Mm. At the time it all happened. Um, it was... Uh, a I think like a lot of people, um, I was in a, actually, this would be an interesting thing to mention, maybe later I'll mention it, but I, I um, spoke on a panel um, of essentially performing artists uh, during the pandemic, and they were all independent artists. Um, and I was on the panel and there was a burlesque performer, Pearl Noir, on the panel. And she talked about, um, you know, when, when things really kind of shut down, she had to go through this kind of mourning process in a way, both for uh, for what was lost in terms of her community, but also her professional life and, and, and all of these things. And I feel like in some ways, um, you know, the, the loss of life and everything that is happening around us, um, in some ways you become not quite numb, but it's hard to quite know where to categorize that. And um, for me at the, at the moment when everything was quite terrifying in March, um, uh, there was a lot happening professionally that I just kind of had to shove aside. Like the book that you had mentioned, Playwrights on Television, was actually being released. I think the exact date was like March 6th, right? It was like the week of um, the lockdown. And, um, and I was upstate um, doing a play development workshop at a great um, art center called Hubbard Hall. And they have a relationship with the Bushwick Star Theater where they, they it's a fairly new uh, program where they bring up the Bushwick Star season artists to Hubbard Hall um, in order to develop the work and essentially do a, a workshop. Um, so I was in this tiny town of Cambridge, New York and um, uh, trying to develop this, this, this play called um, Preparedness, which is actually somewhat about this kind of sense of um, precarity in higher education. And my, uh, director, uh, Chris Thor, a really fantastic director who's worked primarily in immersive theater, um, came up to the development um, site with me. And I remember, I will like never forget him walking in with a, a huge thing of Clorox wipes. His wife is a doctor and he just kind of walked in and put them on the table. And at that, I, I sort of think of that as like a beginning moment because my, my alert was not yet up, right? I think we were like washing hands more and things like that. Um, and we actually had gone, we went out to dinner that week um, and his wife had said, you, you, have, you can't, you guys have to, you know, like you're in. 
And it was a really touch and go time. I mean, my, my wife is an actor um, who also teaches in the CUNY system. And so there was a, even though I was upstate, there was a big question of when are they going to cancel classes? Um, it was that very, um, it felt like a, such a vulnerable moment, you know, where you realize that all of your, 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 that your physical health is now in the hands of your leaders, not necessarily just federal, federal, state, the people making decisions at your college, the people making decisions on the MTA. I mean, you're now um, looking at the people next to you saying, what decision did you make before you entered this cafe, right? It was like that very heightened moment where people didn't also quite know which precautions for sure to take and the, the shelter in place hadn't been announced yet in New York. Um, and while I was up there, they basically, it was just supposed to be for a week, but they made the decision to cancel the showing that was to be Saturday night. And, uh, and then New York announced the lockdown. And the, the, the reason why I think that was also such a profound place to be at that moment was because it was such a small town that it was like a microcosm of what happens when you close down an arts center. It was like, they made the decision to lock down and then you could see how this tiny town the restaurants, the people that would normally, everywhere that my, myself and my director would go, we weren't going. And we weren't going to go to the brewery. And the children that were going to this art center for after school programs didn't get to go there. So it was like, you could see it because the town was quite small, the ripple effect. And that was quite chilling in a way, if you think about the city and the arts and you just, just have been kind of trained to think of this as an ecosystem, yeah. And you don't necessarily think of the arts as just an industry that stands alone. Um, mm. It was very clear to me from that moment that um, the way that that ecosystem was kind of, I don't want to say shredded because it sounds too mm. dramatic, but it did feel that something had been kind of, you know, it's attenuated. Really yeah. It yeah. And it then, was, yeah. yeah. And I think, yeah, it's really one of those moments. I mean, I saw, I was there in Berlin when the wall opened up, um, mm. you know, all the, World Trade Center and smokes up before the mm -hmm. second building went down. And of course we were there on this March, uh, you know, when uh, the shutdown was implemented. I actually mm -hmm. falsely warned three days earlier all my friends because uh, I had heard from someone in Washington that this is going to happen. And everybody said, it's a joke, you know, it's wow. fine, fake news. And uh, mm -hmm. I felt bad, but I, I, I thought it's inevitable. But let's come to your book, um, Hillary. Yeah. And I want our listeners to know um, this is a very serious uh, uh, contribution Hillary mm -hmm. made, and what we're going to talk about is very serious and of importance, mm -hmm. and I think also of consequence. Mm -hmm. um, she studied the 70s. The moment we live in right now will be studied by historians, mm -hmm. sociologists, uh, anthropologists, but also by theater historians and others, and, uh, and by people who look at urban development, so that we are in the middle of it. We actually are also part of it, part of change, where we can do something. So Hillary, in a way, um, I said uh, before, was like a, a back to the future. So she's coming uh, with us, uh, something with some messages, uh, and she perhaps will write about in the next 10 or 15 years, if she will do a book about post-pandemic theater in New York City, and there will be studies done about this, but we're still in the middle of it. Hillary has studied for many, many years, I don't know how long you worked on the book, my guess is five, six, seven years, you went okay. through archives. She looked at the greatest crisis uh, in the cultural landscape, I okay. think, uh, at New York City, I mean, experience besides perhaps World War II, uh, but we're still theaters, we're open and we're working. And, but um, and it's called the book, Drop Dead Performance in Crisis, 1970, as I said, and uh, it's a fascinating, I'm reading a little bit from the description, a fascinating, and comprehensive exploration of how the city's financial crisis shaped theater and performance practices in that de turbulent decade, but also beyond. New York City performance arts community suffered greatly from the severe reduction in grants in the mid 70s. And uh, Hillary you know, put together, you know, skillfully and synthesized uh, economics, urban planning, tourism and immigration to create a map of the interconnected urban landscape and to contextualize the struggle for resources. And she looked at many theaters and professionals, Alan Stewart, La Mama, uh, Carol, uh, 
uh, Bulvaso, Joe Papp from the public and uh, very, very, very closely. And she combined theater history and a very close history of productions. And it's a case study of a companies of productions and uh, as elements of the infrastructure of New York City. And she visited Broadway, off Broadway, off of Broadway, Coney Island, BAM, community theaters. And uh, she really had a close look um, at uh, what happened. And it's a, it says now, it's a lively account of the financial crisis and the resulting transformation of the performing arts community. Uh, chronicle and also kind of bearing witness to the choices that have been made that affect us to today. Um, so I think this is the most serious subject we are talking about. I think everybody should listen um, to Hillary, what she looked at, what she found. So Hillary, mm -hmm. tell us a bit about New York City in the 70s when it faced a moment like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a big, it's a huge question. I think, um, I mean, one place to start is to look a little bit pre-70s, I guess, in the sense that um, the one thing that continually came out in my study is that um, it's it was a very reactionary period. And a lot of what is sort of um, appreciated and today celebrated about theater in New York in the 1960s, including something like the uh, real flourishing of um, outdoor performance, for example, a lot of that was then curtailed by the 1970s um, fiscal crisis. And so what was the most, I think, um, startling for me, just because it, it hadn't necessarily been something that I had really thought about in terms of thinking of theater as a kind of public service in the city, I hadn't really thought so um, committedly before this book about how when you read in the paper that because of the fiscal crisis um, funds for say uh, cleaning the beaches are cut or if you read that funds for um, the parks department is cut something like that it's really hard to understand how that kind of cut then sort of filters to performing arts but it does and how, and, and it's hard to sort of um, exactly conceptualize how things like cutting library hours then filter into theater performance, but it absolutely does. And it happens in more abstract ways because of the way that we just um, start to sort of almost expect less, right? We expect less free performance or we expect less, um, uh, decentralized neighborhood performance. It just becomes almost like in the 70s, in some ways, the expectations became very tamped down of what uh, of, of what sort of theater could be. And, and that is one of my bigger fears for right now, actually, is that um, I think that um, among the, the theaters, for example, that I looked at in the book, um, the ones that were the most successful in surviving the 1970s. And this is a, a generalization that I think can hold true is that many of the more um, um, experimental and that could have been politically experimental or formally experimental um, theaters that had just been formed in the 1960s couldn't survive because it was grant money that they had been surviving on or it was just um, you know the way that, uh, that their theater tickets uh, you know, couldn't sell as much, or it was the way that um, they lost the people who had been helping prop up their theater because they left the city, right? So those theaters were so much more vulnerable than the ones that were on city land. And that was so one of the biggest takeaways. Died. Theater companies died. Theater companies Absolutely. Oh, I mean, so many that they, it, it can't even be counted. I mean, we can think of the ones that died in the in the late six, in the early seventies um, and the bigger ones, but I mean, there were so many that couldn't survive. And, and that is actually, I have to say one of the things that kind of makes my skin crawl right now is when you hear this rhetoric of, um, well, wealthy people will leave the city. And so for that reason, we can't make, uh, let's say changes to, uh, I don't know, the tax structure, for example. 
it's it it's a little bit of a it's not quite a red herring, but um, uh, mobility is a concern for everybody in the city, right? It's not just like, yes, wealthy people have a higher level of mobility, but there are plenty of instances in the 70s and today when um, we need to also be thinking about keeping the people who are at every level of the income bracket, because it is not, the 70s showed that that fear, that line of fear of people are leaving, people are leaving, people are leaving, um, wealthy people are leaving, that then dictated certain decisions. And it turned out that those people pretty much weren't even really leaving, right? They were like going to the suburbs, but we're gonna come back anyway for the theater. So there was a whole line that I think a lot of decisions were based off of. Um, you know, one example that I look at in my book is TKTS. And TKTS was created during this time. And it was entirely- Can you explain a bit what it is for people who don't know? Oh, absolutely, yes. So TKTS is the um, discount tickets that you can buy uh, usually either the day before or a few hours before a Broadway show, also some off-Broadway shows um, and some other theaters. Um, and it was created during this time ostensibly. Yeah, oh, did you want to say something? No. Oh no, so it was ostensibly created because um, they, Broadway realized that, that um, they needed to try to diversify the people who were coming to Broadway. And Times Square was at a moment in which um, its, its reputation was uh, not great. And there was a lot of um, hesitation and concern about going to Times Square. So, um, you know, part of what I explore in my book is how much that was true and how much it was just becoming a neighborhood where there were, um, let's say, a higher number of um, young people of color going to the movies. You know, the neighborhood was changing. All of these neighborhoods were changing. So that's not to say there was zero crime at all, um, but just to say that um, the narrative that was pushing times that was pushing a lot of theaters to support TKTS was, you know, we, it was part of this, we have to clean up Times Square narrative. Um, so they created TKTS, but when they created it, they marketed it pretty much exclusively to tourists. And they didn't really think about what TKTS could mean for other neighborhoods and for other people around the city. And they really created a program that um, is phenomenal. I mean, I love TK. It's a great, it's a great, um, it's it's a great almost asset to the city. Um, but uh, it, it's pretty clear that it was not designed to actually change the audiences going to Broadway or expand the audiences growing going to Broadway. And that's what I mean about certain decisions being made. That in the process of creating this great program, the concern became how do we keep people from leaving the city? And there's a really wonderful, I sh should say wonderful, I mean, wonderful as a researcher when you, when you start stumbling on it, but there was a, a major disagreement with um, Joseph Papp, where Joe Papp basically, um, you know, made a really strong argument for changing the audiences that were going to be showing up at the theater. He wanted, he, he didn't quite so much care about getting back the suburban audiences and was making an argument that in some ways is echoed in discussions that we have now about the um, heterogeneity of audiences for theater, Broadway and otherwise still. And he was absolutely accused of driving people out of the city. I mean, people accused, accused a lot of the, the changes. He, they accused him in terms of the changes that he was trying to make um, at Lincoln Center, where he was for some years, as being part of this, as being part of convincing people that there was a financial crisis, the city was going down the tubes, and um, and it wasn't for them anymore. So that's potentially a sort of long way of saying that because it's a very different time. I mean, obviously, a global pandemic. You know, we do need to look at other examples, right? Spanish flu, all of these things. It's never going to track exactly onto the 1970s because there is so much that is so unique about um, what we're experiencing right now. But I find some of the the return of these narratives to be the part that is very disturbing because it is a very different time. So to continually go back to this kind of um, uh, this way of thinking about what could happen to the city. 
Um, and this continued sort of lack of attention to um, the, the how just varied our arts landscape is and how it's not just about big centralized art spaces. Um, that is concerning because it's a different time, but we sort of continually fall back into these similar ways of responding or similar fear-based narratives about New York as a place. Yeah. Yeah, and people, uh, people did leave the city, some mm -hmm. as people left Newark after the riots, it was, you know, like perhaps even until now has not fully recovered from mm -hmm. that. So struggling is on a good way, but uh, what roles did the artists play? They stayed, mm -hmm. I think, a lot of mm -hmm. them. What, yeah. what, what, how did they react? Uh, I mean, you just said there were less grants. Um, there mm -hmm. was also a conservative climate uh, mm -hmm. into the production of culture, but artists stayed. What did they do? And were they part of the reimagining of the city? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in um, absolutely they were. And, you know, one, I mean, one thing that I think is so different right now is that one of my fears is is that um, a lot of artists won't stay because it, the city for many artists, um, especially just if you, um, I mean, I guess just again, like I don't like all the generalizations, but just broadly speaking, it was still at that period um, relatively easier for an artist to remain living here. And that means rent, availability of jobs, all of these things. And so one of the concerns right now is just that um, it, it, without things like uh, rental assistance and all of that stuff, it, it, it is harder and harder and harder if you are an artist to then reach any level of employment, right? And so if, if there is no help, if there's no help for a restaurant industry that employs a lot of artists, then the fear is that that would be a really big difference from the 70s because they wouldn't be able to stay. Um, so that's just like a baseline concern. Um, so you say potentially this crisis is more dangerous uh, than what New York City experienced in the 70s when it was broke. Okay. I mean, the, the, for sure, that would. Be, I think that that's a distinct possibility for the arts, absolutely. Because even if you look at, um, you know, there have been some really wonderful oral histories done. I did some interviews for the book. It wasn't heavily interview based, but I did a decent number of interviews and the issue of precarity and the issue of the cost of um, mounting a show and producing a show was certainly a concern. But the issues of getting um, priced out of um, the, you know, the boroughs was a lot less of a concern and and people the the sense of artists leaving um, to go elsewhere. Certainly there were plenty of artists in the 70s who said, you know, um, I've had it, I'm going to Vermont or, or whatever it might have been, or I'm going to LA to do um, film production work. There was, of course, a huge exodus in the 70s of theater artists going to LA. Um, but it, it's, it's really incomparable. It, you can't even compare it to the sense of how challenging it is for an artist to stay living in New York right now, um, especially with, with no, no federal support, no um, sense that there's going to be, um, a light at the end of the tunnel, right? Since the vaccine doesn't necessarily mean um, financial help for artists. Um, so, so yeah, so that's just a general concern. I mean, I, I, maybe I'm completely off base, but that is, this, that is my, that is a fear. Um, so in terms of how artists were a part of the recovery, um, you know, it's so, I think one of the ways that artists were a huge part of the recovery was, um, neighborhood was entirely about neighborhood health. Um, so for example, one of the great successes I think of the period, and um, I say successes, but in the book, I look at sort of the complexity of how we evaluate it, but it would be BAM. It would be the Brooklyn Academy of Music as a kind of model for, um, you know, an organization that became a kind of, um, I, I guess you could call it a, a stabilizer um, in a sense, you know, of a, 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 a nexus of neighborhoods that were um, incredibly hard hit, right? Every, you could look at everything from uh, trash collection to movie theaters closing down. I mean, the neighborhoods around BAM were so hard hit by the fiscal crisis period. 
and the fact that there was a stable art center that um, was protected by the city that had strong leadership. And again, there are many caveats to this and that had also committed in a many different ways to bringing in um, artists across the political spectrum, across, you know, um, of different disciplines. I mean, that kind of um, stability, I think that ended up being one of the great case studies of the book because it is so complex and you could find a lot of missteps and a lot of ways in which you can criticize the role of BAM in its neighborhood. But I think overall, that's an example of um, really a, a, a nexus of neighborhoods that were strengthened by having an art space like that. And whether they did this enough or not is part of the, is, is one question, but BAM's method of kind of bringing in companies that could then stabilize those companies was also a great model. And, um, and I, you know, that's one of the reasons too why I looked at a very sort of um, city supported um, institution like BAM and one that went, that had a very long history. And then I also looked at a neighborhood like Coney Island. And I think when we look at something like that, the, the, the city has in some ways been so negligent about developing um, the, just the sheer performance, entertainment, um, arts potential of an area like Coney Island. And they've been that way for sort of decades, but, but even worse from the 70s um, on that it's really hard to look now at a space like Coney Island and realize that it, it, it's an area where artists um, are, are still flourishing, but often only supported um, through uh, a very small number of institutions. And it could, I mean, an area like that could be so helped by sort of like sustained support for the arts. But I, I oftentimes in the 70s, the lesson that came was that there's something safer about going back to the same institutions so that it, it almost like re-centralized an arts landscape that was becoming decentralized in the 1960s with all kinds of you know, mm -hmm. arguments for community, neighborhood control and community control. And then there's a fiscal crisis and all the belts are squeezed and suddenly it goes back to the safe, the safe organizations. And like you said, we saw that now with the federal money, you can now go online, you can look up what theaters got PPE and you can compare the amount that a Carnegie Hall or a Lincoln Center is getting versus an institution that might be in a neighborhood have been there for 40 years, but is just like right on the margin in terms of, you know, it could, it could fall off. So I, I think that that kind of unevenness um, hampered how artists were able to be involved in the 1970s. Um, and in some of the best case scenarios, they were able to be very involved in this kind of neighborhood. Um, I don't wanna say revitalization, but sort of neighborhood stabilizing. Um, and and the, the, the question is sort of what are the things that are gonna be able to do that now and do that better? Because as I mentioned from the beginning, there are some areas like, for example, outdoor performance that, that really um, the city entered into a much more restrictive period in terms of its use of public space, its availability of public space. And it, it didn't recover where it had been pre-fiscal pre crisis for something like that. Hmm. That's, uh, that's uh, quite, uh, quite stunning to think that somehow um, advances, as you say, and I would agree in the 60s, you know, of an opening mm -hmm. of, uh, definition of art performances of theater, outdoor uh, parks, uh, parking lots that um, we haven't basically recovered till now. Now we are hit um, uh, with a crisis that potentially and not put but most probably it hits the communities harder exactly. than in the most uh, dangerous time um, for the arts in the last century of New York City. Um, hmm. what's, what's, um, what's your, what should people do? I, 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 my guess is you follow a little bit also New York uh, uh, 
the city policy, uh, the commissioner for the arts. I mean, they are really trying also to help their implementing policies. Uh, the great Jimmy van Bremer, I think yesterday, um, also helped to, 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 to get things done and to open things up. But w what are they doing? Do you think that's right? Maybe you can give us a little overview mm -hmm. if, in case you know what the city is trying yeah, to do. Yeah, I try to. I mean, well, so this might be one very instructive thing from also from the 70s, because it's a program that um, uh, hasn't been talked about quite a bit. I talk about it a little bit in my La Mama program, but there was something called um, CETA, C-E-T-A, um, and it's not as well known or popularly discussed as, um, you know, like the New Deal arts program in the 1930s. And, I've, and a lot of people today, I mean, there was just a really interesting article in City Limits magazine, actually, uh, I think it was by David Brand about, you know, we need a kind of new deal for the arts today. Um, because as I'm sure, as I know, you know, Frank, I mean, when you look at the kind of, I think the arts got like 0.01% of the, of the first um, coronavirus bailout page. And all of that, um, much of that was funneled to things like the um you know the national uh, uh center for humanities and things like that um the national institute for humanities so on the federal level um it's like there's a gaping hole right and obviously there's a gaping hole on the federal level while we have this administration but the concern is who's actually advocating you know we don't have a, a cabinet level position and anything like it in arts and cultures so and I think almost more instructive than looking at something like um, the 1930s era public works programs, even though I think those are such important sort of inspirations to look to, is in the 1970s, there was a, a program that was actually um, signed into law by Richard Nixon of all people, um, that was meant to um, uh, try to help the unemployment, uh, the national unemployment level that nationally in the 70s was, um, incredibly strong, not just in the city, in New York. And so SETA, I'm forgetting, I think it stands for like comprehensive employment training. I'm going to forget the A. Um, but it w essentially gave block grants. It is America. I'm sure it's America. <laughs> exactly. It essentially, you're probably right. It essentially gave block grants to states, which, you know, um, uh, Republicans were able to sign on to. And it it ended up nationally hiring tens of thousands of artists once they included um, artists in the SETA grant funding. And there are some amazing examples in the 70s of, um, you know, La Mama was very involved. I write about one production of Faust. Um, there was actually a German director, Benowitz, Benowitz yeah. um, mm -hmm. directed a, a SETA production and they did chamber music concerts. And so this was really federal funding the states and then the states dispersed it and it included things like photographers. I mean, there were so many artists involved in this. And that was just in the 70s. And that ended up being, um, you know, billions of dollars of employment, um, not just for artists, that was for the whole program. But it, it feels to me like there are examples that are closer than the 1930s, like SETA, and I know there are, uh, there's actually a group of artists who got SETA funding in the 70s, led by a photographer who are trying to advocate for this approach to funding. Um, and I find that fascinating because I think that the people who got direct funding from SETA in the 70s um, are in a really unique position to say, this worked, this is how it worked. Um, so that's, you know, that kind of, that kind of um, approach of looking at states figuring out um, their needs is very attractive to me on some level because you, we already know that in terms of the arts, every single locality is going to have its own needs. Um, and so connected to that, it, as you mentioned, I think it's exciting uh, it was, as you said, Council, Council Member Van Bramer, who's, who's been sort of the leading voice for cultural affairs in the city. I think Brad Lander and a number of other city council people have supported this. And so yesterday, uh, the city council was voting on a, on a whole package of a, a, basically a bill that would have allowed, that would 
would make it much easier for arts organizations to perform outside, very similar to how they were able to kind of um, push push forward um, outdoor dining and things like that. And so this would say to arts organizations, we're gonna lower the costs, we're gonna make the permitting very simple, and we're gonna make, just make this easier for you. Which for us as, as, you know, as New York arts people, Frank, I mean, that is saying something because that's also like, well, why was it so hard before? True. Why do I mean, people to die in a corona crisis, right? I mean, it's one of those things where you just say, you know, yes, we're not making this up, right? Like we're not making up that the city has become through the years. And, and, and in some ways this was from a lot of the 1970s sort of crackdown on public space in Times Square or um, cutting of services so that parks might be closed earlier. I mean, all of those things that were occurring then, as well as all of the, the kind of increased you know, the other side that we haven't talked about at all that is certainly in the book is this sort of increased vision of the arts through only either philanthropy or, um, you know, if there's a wealthy uh, developer, can you like make a little public space, you'll get a big tax write off that kind of thinking about the way that things can happen in the city. And I'm certainly not naive. I mean, I wouldn't pretend like we're losing a ton of our tax base right now. I mean, I'm not going to say that the problems that are facing the city are sort of easy to fix and we can just, you know, do outdoor Shakespeare and make everything okay. But I think there's like a level of um, thinking through these problems that the way we've been doing it, for example, the Bloomberg era and, and, and by some accounts, Bloomberg, his, his era was very friendly in some ways to the arts, but in other ways, you know, um, look at a space like the shed, which took a good amount of tax money to, to create. And I certainly think in many ways it was a huge achievement, but in other ways, look at the moment that we're in right now and how that has really not through this incredibly difficult period, been able to be a place of resource for a lot of people for the yeah. numbers of city residents that you would hope would be able to get some kind of solace right now in that space, it, it's not happening as for, to my understanding. Million dollar project um, and, um, and they're doing great and inspiring work also, but did they find ways to, to go outside? No, you also still have to come to that space, pay them, be inside instead of what you pointed out to the 60s where you say, well, maybe um, we have to rethink. Um, Absolutely. And, so and I. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know, I think for me, part of that is staying at least alive to the questions of real estate in the city. And I mean, I've written a little bit about real estate involvement in Coney Island, because that is, you know, Coney Island is such a vibrant arts neighborhood, and the kind of whims of real estate have really altered the way that that can, can even be allowed to develop, the way that the arts mm -hmm. can even be allowed to develop there. So I, I mean, Brad Lander, to bring him up again, he's a city council person as well. And he, is, he published a really interesting op-ed in the Times, essentially saying all of these um, buildings that sadly are now going to be vacant because of the incredible number of businesses going out of business, the landlords, um, how, what are we really planning to do so that it's not a kind of giveaway like it was after the 1970s? What are we going to do so that the, all of that vacant land, can it be purchased by the city and then um, uh, can nonprofit collectives come in to own it? I mean, there are some examples like the Navy Yard. There are some examples of that being done successfully. So how do we make sure that all of that real estate that might now be abandoned is not just kind of like auctioned off um, to the highest bidder of for-profit companies, but actually suggests that there can be um, public interest and public good. And I feel like the arts, I mean, I am not, um, I don't run a theater. I'm just somebody who's like, reads a lot about and researches the seventies and says, you know, how can mm -hmm. that hopefully inform um, today? But I would hope, and I would think that arts administrators, particularly people who have you know, led capital campaigns and really overseen successful theater spaces, I would hope they would be very involved in this question of what there's going to be a lot of real estate and 
where is that abandoned real estate going to end up to what purposes and we need leaders who are going to think about increasing the footprint of the arts in the city as opposed to the way that we tend to think about it right now which is like piecemeal right mm. give you a grant to do this give you a grant to do that you know or maybe or maybe some forward thinking person actually thinks about you know more of an artist career but I don't know, my, when I read articles like that, I think, yes, we need the housing advocates to come together with the arts advocates because that's the only way that we're gonna be making decisions about the space of the city that, that take all of this into account, you know? Yeah, and I, I think you're right. I think a Bloomberg administration um, has uh, done tremendous amount for the arts, with the complications in many other areas, but still it was a, a support. And I think Bloomberg understood that the metamorphosis of the city, which used to be a manufacturing city at the turn of the century, then it became in a way a, a banking city. Um, but you can do banking from everywhere with cyber uh, connections, you know, as we now know on Zoom, nobody needs to be here in Manhattan. And he said, no, this is a city like London or Paris or now Berlin, it's a lifestyle. People want to be here because the most interesting city, it's mm -hmm. the most alive, this, this city that never sleeps but always dreams and the arts are central and the arts who have also brought that energy in the 70s mm -hmm. and the 80s. And it was not made up, it was really true. It was an incredibly yeah. exciting time. Mm -hmm. And the arts have been a force in the recreation um, of the city and if this city will be a, a great city to live in it is because of what we miss so much now the mm -hmm. experience and moments life community discussions uh, um, celebrations and the arts are the ones who bring the people together in circles who sit mm -hmm. together look, look at and create an identity and a connection you know mm -hmm. to a neighborhood a public art piece people look at it and say yeah that's in my neighborhood Mm -hmm. in a small community center, art center in Corneality. Yeah, this is great. You know, there's a community center and I go there. Mm -hmm. And if I have learned anything, I've talked to over 150, close to 200 people, is where people say, no, what is perhaps the most important thing at the moment, the time of Corona, communities, small yes. spaces, mm -hmm. supported. This idea of the small business loan, give loans to small theater, small things and have them, you know, as someone said, mm -hmm. what art does anyway, like the earthworms who create the oxygen that mm -hmm. goes through the law, but without them, nothing would bloom, it would die, mm. it would be closed. And mm -hmm. they're, um, and, uh, but they're invisible, you don't really fully see it. And, yes. um, and um, and also we all do know that we look look listen to music, we look at films, we read mm -hmm. books. It's art that helps us, and it's also what is missing for a fulfilled life. So mm -hmm. the question is, how will that be um, um, represented, and how mm -hmm. will people understand that it is actually not just theater is good, and then the restaurant makes more money yes. economically. But it's also the history of mankind, the mission, mm -hmm. the vision, the vision of humanity and civility mm -hmm. and the civilized world is so strongly connected and how arts are treated is a representation mm -hmm. of a society and all the regimes we do not like, the dictatorial ones, the ones mm. that are uh, 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 in the way of free expression, are the mm -hmm. ones who they don't like the arts, they hate it. We had Abuja, mm. um, Abhijak, Mumba from India who said, you know, my things get, uh, get censored in India. Mm -hmm. We're a tiny company, but people don't like it, you know, and yeah. uh, so, Theater is important, you know, but um, but I think we, we really have to uh, hope and mm -hmm. work for it that uh, uh, the city understands that right. It's a dangerous moment. What what would, would you think uh, if you were one of the commissions? What would you say? This is what ne needs to be done on the mm. city level. What are the structures from your experience for looking over for mm -hmm. such a long time all the documents, what remains? Mm. What do you think will be successful? Mm. I think one of the things that will be successful is um, something that has that it really hasn't been done enough, but when it is done is is remarkable, is when you have a company that has a promising track record. Um, giving them the same thing that you give to the very few, the very lucky ones like BAM and saying, uh, here's your $1 a year lease, right? It's not, I think there are very few, I can't remember if it's 37, how many organizations there are that have that relationship with the city. Yeah. Um, 
I'm thinking about, sorry? New York Theater Workshop and La Mama bought it then for, in the Bloomberg time for $1. They own actually you now the space even, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and I think that um, we're, we see rightfully so a lot, especially now with the movement, um, you know, if you read the, um, <clears throat> the uh, you know, like the, 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 the protests and the Black Lives Matter movement in the way that it has also been um, sort of formulated in theater right now is I think very appropriately also questioning things like, um, you know, oh, you spent all this money on building and what about, what about investing in the people? So um, if you can take that burden away from some theater organizations so that they don't need to spend X amount of their time and salary and all of this on trying to secure a building, I think you would see incredible results. And I'm talking about in every neighborhood and not just saying, let's grow an arts um, street, but actually let's think about this in terms of outposts. And, and you know, one of the reasons why I say that is because uh, one of the most incredible organizations in the 70s that I looked at um, called the Urban Arts Corps, which was led by Vinette Carroll, they did incredible work. And she, um, in the 1950s, ran the Ghetto Arts Program which was a, a, a name for the program that she never really was fully behind, but went along with it to have a kind of impact on how the state was giving out money. And it was, 1950s was the very sort of early days of state funding for the arts. And when you look at her progression as an artist, Vanette Carroll, from the ghetto arts program to then, um, she directed Langston Hughes's work in the 60s. In the 70s, she created the Urban Arts Corps. Um, with Mickey Grant, they took plays to Broadway. Um, Don't bother me, I can't cope. I mean, she had a phenomenal career. If the city had given her a space when, she, when her company was really, really in danger in the 70s, um, it, the legacy of that would have probably continued even today. And instead, the Urban Arts Corps, with everything they did for the city, with everything that she did, um, it was constant, constant financial precarity. And she was also running a training program. So if you think about how these, um, how these, you know, I don't wanna say over maybe privilege that, you know, we need, need, need space. But I do think that in the instance of many of these anchor kinds of companies, their longevity would be incredible if the city thought through a little bit more which, which companies, really specifically, which companies are going to become kind of a node in their area. And obviously that's hard to ascertain, but I think many companies by now have a track record of it. And, you know, we lost Vinette Carroll to uh, Florida. And then, you know, that was where she ended her career. So, so that would be one thing is just this idea of, of thinking again about a decentralized network of spaces as opposed to, um, a more uh, centralized idea of, you know, a theater in a business district or something like this. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be one thing to say. And then I think that the other thing, um, I mean, this is, you know, this is pie in the sky, but I just feel like it's a good time to think outside the box. I mean, we've never been able to really have repertory companies in this city. It, the, the financial model doesn't work out for theater. And I think that um, being able to really think about arts investment in terms of artists more connected to the institutions. A lot of the artists I talked to and even administrators, even before this crisis, were starting to say things like, if I can hire a marketing person, can't I hire a playwright, right? And I know that that's a very small, obviously a very small number of jobs, but I think that if that kind of practice becomes more widespread because of this time, and we understand that artists, whatever role they have in the theater, um, need this kind of true stability, right? That they can't, if they can't find it in teaching for a whole variety of reasons, including what is happening in teaching and employment and precarity, is there a way that arts organizations can really proactively not just say, okay, grant by grant by grant by grant, but actually um, think in a more long-term way about artist sustainability. So that would be more on the artist end. Mm -hmm. And then on the, um, on the question of the city and on the question of, um, you know, arts 
and 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 what is sort of like the city government's role in encouraging it and all of this i mean i think that that it that it, it again comes down to this question of access and i don't want to keep you know uh I don't want to like take a word that maybe has been like oh become overdetermined, but I really do think I mean as someone who teaches somewhere where sometimes I meet students who are going to their very first play on campus, and as you just said, which I didn't know, CUNY has twenty stages. Um, the sort of like closedness which with which the city thinks through something like that um, is very frustrating. So to give you an example. I think that something like um, a CUNY theater stage could be a lot more vibrantly connected to its neighborhood. During the height of the lockdown, if I walk past Brooklyn College, the gates were slammed shut. And that's acres of green space for people in the area that might not have any green space, right? That's acres that you could have performances on or this or that. It's not that it's, <clears throat> small thinking, but do they have the money to keep it open to pay for the security staff, right? It's not like a lack of ideas, but yeah. if the city isn't thinking about um, a CUNY institution as also an arts institution that has a responsibility to its neighborhood, it's not really going to think about, well, can we open the gates on a week on a weekend? Mm -hmm. And I just feel like that's the kind of thinking that um, needs to happen in every single area hyper locally because it is terrifying the degree to which this unevenness, the way that in the city, all of the inequity in the city, of course, is just as, as we all know, as we all read, it's just being put on display. Anyone who wanted to deny it before can now no longer, right? That someone in one neighborhood does not have the kind of arts, healthcare, any kind of access that someone in another neighborhood has. So if that isn't part of the conversation, it's going to be somebody writing the same book, right? In, in however many years, they're gonna write the same book about an uneven recovery. Um, and that, I mean, that would be, I think, um, incredibly sad if, if what we were left with was sort of like a whole slew of maybe like, you know, Di more permissible dining on the street standards, but actually not, not anything that is substantive in terms of what you were just describing before, cultural, spiritual, you know, everything that we get from the arts. Um, mm -hmm. So those are the, you know, those, that's the, I know that it, I, perhaps that sounded very abstract, but I feel like those are the terms that I'm trying to think yeah. about how the city can imagine this because I don't, I wouldn't know the first thing about how thick the red tape is to achieve some of what I'm describing. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, but I think it's very clear what you say. And it's also, it's not just as a statement, what you think you have looked at it, you have studied it, you should be actually part of those city commissions to say give ownership to the organization that are already out there, mm -hmm, uh, support mm -hmm. them in that way, in a sustainable way to have the real estate, especially if so much is empty now. Um, you know, create um, mm -hmm. these kind of uh, the, the, the artist workforce, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, for, for, for Brexit to hire them in a way and uh, that they also communicate and con are in contact with communities, the arts, the sciences, mm -hmm. and all the things mankind, mankind perhaps had since Aristotle, mm -hmm. um, what the role, role of the art um, could be, and to take serious um, the contribution. And many people in Europe do wonder why there is no Ministry of Culture in the US. Why is it so complicated um, um, to, to buy a theater ticket? You know, that is so exactly or goes to a Broadway production and has to, has to take subways or taxi and then eats out. It will be, I don't know, maybe $600. Mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm. Nobody come, nobody goes. And it's very clear it's not produced mm -hmm. for these. Uh, communities it's clear yeah. that per head uh, investment in manhattan for the mm -hmm. arts it's about i don't know it's like over a hundred dollars 120 compared to maybe eight seven eight or nine dollars is i might not be completely right mm -hmm. with numbers, but in queens where you teach it is under ten dollars exactly but on these neighborhoods where the especially vince manhattan is already mm -hmm. so fully developed Mm -hmm. Didn't it show very clearly the incredible impact Lincoln Center had in also stabilizing mm -hmm. the West Side? You know, Marty Siegel, after whom our uh, yeah. his name was such a great 
uh, 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 the uh, proponent of the Lincolns and helped, you know, to implement mm -hmm. it. So the idea always was that it's connected um, um, to the city. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we have to understand that this role can also play in Staten Island, even perhaps, you know, the times really might not go there now, but they mm -hmm. will. It's yes. interesting. The decentralized structures like how it is in so many countries of the world where you don't have just one city for America, one mm -hmm. part of a neighborhood, the life will be richer. And there's an interesting conversation we had also with Florian Malsacker, a German a curator who, as his witness, called Chantal Mufler. She's a polit political mm -hmm. scientist from mm -hmm. Belgium. She said, we have to realize there will never be an end of struggle. The yes. leftists' ideas that perhaps one mm -hmm. day everybody comes to an agreement and uh, the workers and the mm -hmm. labor and the people who have the money and the state say, no, it will always be contradictory ideas. We have to get used mm -hmm. to the fact it will not be solved. Mm -hmm. What we have to do is to accept to live with this and have spheres, arenas, spaces mm -hmm. where there is some kind of a competition of ideas where you show things and where you discuss them in all the complexities mm -hmm. and everybody who says it's black or white like the trumps of the world they're mm -hmm. lying to us the world is not like this so they are mm -hmm. really manipulating us and they are the ones who we should be afraid of and not the ones they tell us who, who, who they warn us against yeah. and the theater music, dance, poetry actually is the space where everybody mm -hmm. can come with an open mind, everybody's welcomed. And you have an arena, as she said, an agonism is the term coming out of theater, mm -hmm. where you have a f competition of ideas with some rules, but mm -hmm. it's really uh, uh, people come and talk to each other mm -hmm. and listen to each other and have a, have a, a moment of, yeah. of, of a community. And we do not talk as this becomes clearer and clearer in this election going away mm -hmm. and she said ultimately if we do not accept the idea of um, <clears throat> that we will always have to you know struggle that democracy mm -hmm. is always to come it's not here mm -hmm. yet. it will always be uh, in the future if we don't accept it, it will be a civil war basically mm -hmm. because people will never agree that scissor will open mm -hmm. and more and more and that theater and culture mm. as it has shown the history of mankind when it flourished when it worked out it helps us to connect mm -hmm. And I think uh, we all are incredibly afraid for this big city. Uh, we are mm -hmm. very concerned about the artists who I think made an enormous contribution. And as you pointed out, it was in the 70s how devastating the situation was. New York City was bankrupt and could mm -hmm. not pay. Everybody would have left Wall Street, would have left mm -hmm. the city. It was Detroit and the Rudin family. Mm -hmm. The unions who said we pay taxes up, up for 10 years up front, we will mm -hmm. not have, we will have lower wages. They saved the city. And the artists who got actually also till the mid 70s, if I understand right, also from you, but were supported in a good way. It was mm -hmm. easier to get a yeah. grand as a female feminist filmmaker to make mm -hmm. a 60 minute film. We showed them at the, in the Seagull often, you know, out of the mm -hmm. archives of Lincoln Center that, um, and it connected people, it worked. And, and but it also perhaps is forgotten. And now we have to, I think, not only thank them for that incredible recovery the city made with the help of the artists, but now they are suffering the most. Yeah. But they also have something in there that can save us. And I yeah. think uh, we have to listen carefully, you know, to, to what you said, because there will be books written and stuff. But right now is the time also for action. So anybody who listens now, really, this is a, a very serious mm -hmm. moment. These are very serious uh, evaluation mm -hmm. um, that comes from you. As a question, as a really, really honest question, mm -hmm. what do you think what will happen? What's your prediction? What, will this be uh, 10 years uh, mm. of, uh, um, of complications? Will it be the 60s? It's now 60 years ago, mm -hmm. 70 years ago. And you say maybe the, yesterday, the make it easier to do stuff in public places. It took 70 years mm -hmm. to do that. But what do you think? Will there be, we talked about it this week, the Roaring Twenties, will people after, like after World War I, mm -hmm. and Spanish, where people went out and enjoyed mm -hmm. that, will we have that? Or do you think lessons that have not been learned are uh, uh, repeating itself? Someone said, we have to study history because then we know we don't learn from history. Mm -hmm. So um, do you think, what do you really think? What will happen in New York? 
<laughs> oh gosh. Um, I'm, I'll tell you why I'm um, pessimistic and then I'll tell you why I'm optimistic. Maybe <laughs> okay. I think I'm feeling um, a little bit, um, I, I tend to get a little bit pessimistic because the conversations can feel very cyclical, right? So um, for example, ex you know, exactly what you were just saying about this continued disparity between how much money is spent in Queens on the arts versus, you know, in Manhattan. That same debate was raging in the 70s. Um, people were saying museums are not, um, you know, fully representative of the diversity of the city, for example. They were, there were protests. Um, Stat the, the borough president of Staten Island was saying, how dare we give so much money to uh, the Brooklyn um, Academy of Music, Staten Island gets even less money per person for their arts. This was the, the argument in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So there can be something a little bit, um, you know, that time is not exactly this time, Many much is different. And yet when you start to hear that the, the terms of the debate haven't shifted because there hasn't really been a meaningful investment in, in changing those conditions, um, that can feel um, like that kind of researcher deja vu of like, will we just continually be, let's say, catering to the vision of a um, you know wealthy Manhattan urban center and sort of continually forgetting about um, this network of boroughs and how dynamic the city is and where people are actually living and the contributions of let's say immigrants. I mean, all of these things you're saying, you know, why do we in this city continually sort of um, uh, I don't want to say forget because I don't think it's forgetting, but the forces that are um, in favor of one vision are, you know, again, winning out. And so I think that the concern is that we're not, um, uh, I don't want to say not learning from it, but I think that's, that the times that I'm pessimistic about what the future will look like is when it feels like we're back um, we're back on our heels when we advocate for this. So for example, advocating for CUNY right now can be very challenging because the entire city is hurting so yeah. massively. Yeah. And if somebody said to me, well, um, the New York City health and hospital system, it has essentially kept this, you know, us from entering a healthcare, a full blown, we're already in a crisis, but helped us, you know, from entering it even deeper, and plenty of people in New York City health and hospitals would say, well, we deserve that money too, right? So everything is always about this kind of like competition for public resources and the forces that wanna make that seem like, oh, well, but there's this tiny pie and you know everybody needs to cut it up. Those, those voices are often, um, often feel as though they are sort of in that upper hand position. So I think that sometimes that can be quite frustrating because um, it, it feels as though we're not operating. I mean, you just mentioned this kind of um, sense of needing somewhere and the space where we all kind of battle out these ideas. There can oftentimes feel as though, well, we're just not operating on even a shared value system. And I don't mean that in a conservative way, but I more mean that as every person in the city should recognize that supporting CUNY is as important as blank, right? Something like that. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Um, so for me, that's where some of the pessimism comes from is like, we're not all kind of, right? Like looking at these things as saying these public goods, theater is a public good and it is important. I mean, there are still people in the city who see CUNY as this kind of, um, through this lens of anti-intellectualism, like why should we support, right? I'm sure you have, have come up against that yourself. So those are the reasons why I tend to get pessimistic, but the, the reasons why um, I can feel some optimism is because I do think that there's an incredible, um, there are incredible sort of um, enlivened forces that are advocating for a different future, right? So in the arts, that is that includes the kinds of demands that are getting much more mainstream um, attention for all for understanding how equity works, right? And so I try to be very optimistic that all of those conversations that have been happening, right? The conversations that the Siegel Center has been a part of, the conversations that many of us have been trying to be a part of, that those are not, um, even though those happen pre-COVID, 
it adds to the steam of like, we have to do this differently. Um, so that would be a hope. And then the other hope would be, I mean, I don't know if this is something that you see as well through these conversations that you've been having, but the vulnerability that everybody feels, I think, I mean, the sense of really being shaken, um, whether you've experienced loss in your family, whether you've experienced loss of just friends or people in your community, whatever it might be, um, and the way that the city had to um, share in the burdens of really sort of taking care of each other, whether it's mask wearing or making a sacrifice, you know, that you that you previously might not have made. I, tr I try to really stay optimistic that many of us are individually being transformed by this. So the hope is that that individual transformation as difficult as it is will also lead to more honest conversations or, you know, political leaders who who see the importance of making these changes so that we don't just constantly sort of revert back to the old positions that have gotten us to the same place, you know, that we will allow this to sort of shake us to such a degree mm -hmm. um, that the changes will be made because the, of course, a big difference with the 70s was that there was a huge amount of um, financial vulnerability. People suffered an enormous amount, um, but the, the, physical, like the healthcare ramifications of that were um, not as direct. I mean, certainly there have been papers written on how the fiscal crisis in the 70s affected people's physical well-being and health, but obviously nowhere near with the kind of direct connection. So that is the hope. I think that that is the hope that um, that we need to have, that we're all so going to be so transformed by this, that the kind of work we do, our arts administrators will be transformed, our politicians, um, so I'm not sure, maybe that sounds a little naive or something, but I think that a lot of people have been um, pushed, right, to consider new alternatives right now. Yeah, yeah, no, I think the, I think you're right with both evaluations, mm -hmm. and it is, of course, our hope yeah. uh, that the later part will also take uh, place. And I think there's someone said there's a difference between optimism and hope. Optimism yeah. is kind of a vague feeling, but hope is you actively work for it. Yes. You do something for any, actually you can do something, you're part of it. We are mm -hmm. no longer subject to the Greeks gods or the, to our fate is decided. No, yes. we are participants. This is mm -hmm. the great promise of democracy. And this is a time now where we all have to take it serious and mm -hmm. we have to find a new form, not only because the world has changed because of COVID, also the old forms did not work. Mm -hmm. And artists mm -hmm. taught us that you can find new forms, but it mm -hmm. also depends who you bring in the room, who is at the table. Exactly. Like someone said yesterday, maybe there shouldn't be a table anymore, you know, and um, um, but you want to be because everybody is in the room and I think that mm -hmm. lessons we learned from the artists to listen evaluate not knowing perhaps where we are going but doing your very best uh, mm -hmm. to create something listening to each other um, is something of, of, of real importance so in our own lives you know we should bring in people our neighbors people we don't talk to hosting radical hosting as someone said you know invite someone absolutely to your home have a stay overnight with someone in queens or what tanya bruguera did for five weeks she exactly family in queens and she said um and i want to say it again she said you know the french revolution was such a great democratic gesture but somehow we all still go to look at the castles of versailles and we are impressed by it in a way often theaters or museums or these kind of you know institutional cathedrals she said we should go to the houses of people to the parks to the public spaces mm -hmm. that series as a lot of contemporary theater makers have shown us we had a long series with carol martin of theater of the real mm -hmm. in the documentaries where there's an interest in the real with the life we is the entry of the spectators and the work through remedy protocol and so many others mm -hmm. that's perhaps the biggest change and it also means something it also means you know that we have to perhaps you know participate again and more and see the theater how it was also as a representation of a state mm -hmm. or something a machine that was on its own it's been fed for entertainment but now we also had to be critical of it and say we need a new form and what was didn't fully work and we mm -hmm. all agree that black lives matter taught us that i think and you know the white theater a bit also you know put the finger on that and uh, yeah. said you know, and it is true where is the native american indigenous theater in new york city 
Mm. City of 12 million on mm -hmm. the brand. Exactly. Could, there can be, we had Spider Woman here. There is not a space for a little 90 seat theater that the city could it's, give them. It's Where's so the true. Caribbean? The Caribbean, yeah. one of the greatest immigrant mm -hmm. uh, um, communities. We did a festival uh, a year ago and we had, you know, from I think from Haiti and Guadeloupe mm -hmm. and Martinique. Mm -hmm. And then my elevator where else it was the first festival if we understood right in the history mm -hmm. of theater not even in france where different countries from from the caribbean came together and play art structure and mm -hmm. showed their place how can that be and some of them are very interesting mm -hmm. good theater you know but they don't have the support they don't have even theater schools so where is that representation of all the people that live where do we see them on the stage where do exactly. we see, hear their stories and everywhere and i think there's something great to discover to you know in those spaces that are mm -hmm. and vallejo yesterday said you know let's look at you know the open things that are there and if things you know won't work we will never perhaps uh, define broadway but i think we might take importance away we say we show a theater we show work mm -hmm. and performances they are perhaps more interesting they are smaller closer but they touch us and as you said in our vulnerability, perhaps it also um, mm -hmm. uh, sense gave us uh, antennas to be mm -hmm. in these sensible spaces and to perhaps understand that the world has changed and it's not so bad if it's different than it mm -hmm. used to be. Perhaps it's more real, and I think theater can do that. But it's a difficult moment, and I think your research, you know, and the about that moment, the seven is so important, and the lessons. I think you should write an op-ed for the New York Times. You should mm. really put that out to your mm. three recommendations. It's an important contribution because right now we do not know where it's going. Also, people mm. make decisions, you know, need help, and also this is where university can mm -hmm. come in. It's for the good of the city, the CUNY system. So. Um, this is an important conversation. I wish we had uh, them every day of the week and we could go on for much, much, much longer. But I think it did highlight. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's so useful to sort of step back a little bit and try to put all of this together, right? Especially now with so many demands on our time, it's nice to just sit down and think about, um, you know, you read an article one day and then you think, where does that fit in, right? So it's this is this is great. So thank you for that. Well, we are in houses and we are in the rooms and we think we are living in the but then someone built the house there are structures sometimes they are exactly. hundreds of years old where someone put the window and the door and what it was has already been decided exactly you know? and, in, and the same invisible structures govern mm -hmm. you know or our cultural uh, policies also we have to i think you mm -hmm. know in this big way in the revealing they are out there right now we see them and it's up to us to really change them and you're part of that and your work Focusing on that, which also I think is very was very encouraging, you know, that scholar said, you know, I'm not writing about the playwright or about this, you know, director. Let's look at the structure of a city, the impact the arts had, how it was connected, how it also helped to change it. As I like that in your research, mm -hmm. that also the arts played in a vital role. You know to connect people make them at home in the city and make them stay and uh, make the city what it is so and it's a big house theater as Hansi Sleman said there's Broadway off Broadway off of performances films poetry there's a big space and it's nothing as you said against more or less for the others but it, we have to know that it's a big house and we have to honor all the rooms and there's a lot of work to do and also everybody who lives in it the majority of inhabitants of new york city are no longer white we are actually the minority mm -hmm. but where is it shown mm -hmm. and their movement is so right the largest civil rights movement in the history of the united states this black lives matter mm -hmm. all that you know also ask us to change and vallejo yesterday voiced a bit his disappointment also with the new york theater say what are they doing as you said why are things closed why do you say oh, our stages are closed so we can't do anything? But don't you have some kind of a budget? Or can you get somebody? Can you hire artists? Can they do something like he does with his foundation? Um, so uh, it's so many, many I, I agree. I think that's a question everybody's asking themselves too. Um, the theaters that you loved going to, do you, yeah. what is happening between you and that theater now? Is that, was that a, an actual connection or was it more about what happened to be there then and how much are these institutions rooted? I mean, I think Vallejo's question is, is something I've been thinking about from the very beginning, right? Why am I not um, doing more online theater watching, for example? Why, do, why am I choosing the things that I am choosing? And, and 
the disappointment that I might feel in certain institutions, where is that coming from? I think that's a great yeah. question that he's asking. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as politicians look at people as voters, businesses look at people just as consumers. And yes, these are people look at ticket holders. That's it. You know, but we have to be different. If we are not mm -hmm. different, nothing else will be different. Yeah. And I think we have to um, um, acknowledge that and, uh, and find a way. Yes, let's give free spaces to Jack. How come that Jack, the great institution, you know, in Brooklyn, that they have to fight and have to change the mm -hmm. campaign the right work they did, especially now in Corona times. Absolutely. The Ars Nova, the great Soho rap, you know, give them spaces, support them in, mm -hmm. in existing initiatives, and um, and it will be better um, for the city and everybody. It will be a, a cause of celebration. And it's devastating to think that perhaps 20, 30, 40 years from now, scholars will evaluate and say, what did New York City just do? Mm -hmm. Why weren't they? taking an action. They knew what happened in the 70s. Mm -hmm. They knew how important that is. Why are they closing uh, mm -hmm. the doors and wait like a, in a storm till it's over mm -hmm. instead of, you know, perhaps reconnecting to the great promise, as you pointed out, of, of the 60s. We say, well, it's a big spaces out there. Mm -hmm. Let's use them. But it also speaks in a symbolic, imaginary way and in yes. a real way to the empty spaces in our societies, yes. in our families, in our... Uh, communities, we have to use it and we can do okay. something. That's why theater is great. Mm. It's a model for something. And if it happens in this theater, it can also happen somewhere else. And this is why we have mm. such a big responsibility. So really, again, Hillary, I'm sorry. Normally, I really try to listen, you know, but I'm so passionate about, about this theme and your Of course. Work. No, I agree with you. And I know we're signing off, but just one final thing. What you were just yeah. saying, the, the intergenerational performances, I think, are going to be more important than ever, right? With so much of us being, with so many of us being locked away from older people right now or older people right. dealing with isolation. I mean, the Bushwick Star, one of the most interesting things that they've done is they moved their, their collaboration with a Bushwick Senior Center into a sort of podcast radio show called, I think it's called Silver Linings Radio. And that's mm -hmm. artists with seniors just making art um, during this period. And I feel like that kind of a program, that kind of thinking goes to the heart of what you were just saying. We see these immense gaps and, and difficulties. And so what is the programming that's going to kind of fit in there? And as you say, these theaters that aren't supported, we will only have ourselves to blame in a way, right? In 30 years. Yeah, and you are someone who could be trusted, who studied it, who knows the field, you're an expert. And, um, and it's, as you point out, it's not so complicated to see the structures and to come to hmm. conclusions. So really, really, really thank you. Thanks for thank all you. this. Thank you. A little bit over time, but I felt it was a very significant and important theme, and it really, really is. So if you're listening and if you're some kind of a position of power, it's something to really reflect about mm -hmm. for artists also to hopefully a bit encouraging to see how significant this contribution is but they always ask to work for free always ask to do something exactly then they are not rewarded not in the long run and not even in the short run it's mm -hmm. wrong we need a sustainable um support so mm -hmm. and, and, and as someone said great sports and great theater great music is a reward for a functioning society the moment mm. it's not functioning let's make it a great functioning one and this mm. is the reward that we can enjoy these mm. games, these uh, moments of of of, um, of collective uh, togetherness. Mm. Yeah. So anyway, so thank you again. Thanks to HowlRound uh, for hosting us, Sia and VJ, uh, Andy from the Siegel Center, and and everybody. Thank it was you. an important uh, a week, and really, Hillary, this is uh, important and groundbreaking, and uh, it's a significant contribution. And we have also in the arc to understand these structures and we okay. cannot just think you know about our own institutions and how we can sell more tickets than others these are big questions mm -hmm. thank you so much and a you, great Frank. weekend for everybody um, stay safe wear a mask and uh, hope to see you soon next week thank, thank you. you so much bye bye